Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, glad you're here and uh, it's fun to be back with you again and uh, before we begin, since we made an announcement last night at the congregational meeting, I thought I'd, I always view the Bible class as a group that I'd like to give the most information to because you guys are my friends. You know, we're glad to hear you, and that goes for you folks watching online also. But as we announced at the congregational meeting is that uh, there's no shock. Michelle and I are going to be moving to uh, Henderson, Nevada, and um, the plan is that Michelle is going to go mid-January, and uh, primarily because my daughter and son-in-law move out of our house December 7, and we don't want an empty house there for a long period of time. And so she'll move out. And the other reason is that she wants to take care of her dad. So her dad is 83 in an assisted living facility, doing pretty well, but um, she wants to, to be there. Every time we come out, she takes him to the doctor and uh, to Walmart or different things that he wants to, to get. And uh, so she'll be out first. When it comes to me, I am, uh, kind of playing it a little bit by ear depending on occupations. Um, I had an interview last week. I actually flew out for just a couple of days, uh, Tuesday to Saturday, um, and I was to be a chaplain of a prison um, and uh, be kind of a different world, but it was a great interview. It's, uh, it was at the police department of Las Vegas where I uh, did the interview. My problem with that job is I'm probably like way overqualified for it um, based on what they're looking for and what I have. I mean, for example, they said, do you have any experience in leadership? I said, I have my doctorate in leadership. You know, it was th that kind of thing. Um, but it was a good interview and that was, that was fun. Um, I've, interviews for me are fun. You get to talk about yourself, you know. What could be more fun than that? <laughs> but um, I have another uh, interview, kind of an interview, um, coming up in November, and it's at a church that I would be very interested in. Um, it's because it, is, it would be a pastor of discipleship, and the pastor, the senior pastor, wants to start a seminary. Well, I am a qualified seminary professor, so I would be fun for me to help him get that seminary off the ground, and uh, the church is about 600 people. Um, so it's, it's not as big as Shelter Rock, but it's a good sized church. So you can picture that's what comes on Sunday morning here in Manhasset. Um, and uh, it, you know, it wouldn't be the, the head honcho, but I would be a support role. And I think that's one is a good position for my next stage in life. The problem with that church though, I think they're very interested in me, but they, they're afraid of the economy. And so they're not sure they wanna stretch and add a new salary, even though they are uh, wanting, potentially me, to be there. Regardless, they're wanting to talk to me, and uh, we'll see what God has in store. Beyond that, there's another church in the small community of Boulder City, which is the pastor 75, and he would like me to consider being his replacement. Um, now, he doesn't have it in his control, but he has influence, and he has had me preach there eh, about five times over the last three years. And I'm actually gonna be preaching there November 13th. And so um, that is interesting. That'd be a church of 100 people, but the, the government of the church could be argued to be somewhat dysfunctional in the sense that you have a church of 100 people and 25 of them are on the board. It's just, too many, it's a Congress, you know. Here at church, we're a church of 2,000 people and we have seven board members, you know, just to give you the, there's a reason why Shelter Rock Church is able to get things done, is that you don't have to, you know, convince 25 people, you know, to move in a particular direction. And so that is interesting. I would be senior pastor of a smaller church and I think I could grow the church but it would be one of these start from scratch things and I'd have to do all my leadership skills and all the finesse I have to try to help a small church that has really not had vision for a long time once again have vision. And, um, and there's another thing, um, 
This is, a, this is just a challenge. You know how Jesus said, don't put new wine into an old wineskin? Um, this particular church was founded to be ecumenical because it was the only church when the dam was built, Hoover Dam. And they wanted to minister to all the workers building the dam. So they still have this root. And because of that, theologically, they're kind of mushy. Um, the current pastor is very solid and evangelical, but the church itself is kind of like hippy-dippy, you know, here, there, everywhere. And I'm not sure that is just a healthy foundation to build on. So these are the things that I'm praying about. And if nothing emerges, I'm here till Easter. But if something emerges that is like, no, I think that's a great thing, I would go sooner, depending on, you know, timetables and things like that. And my mom would be coming with me, and my uh, one daughter would be coming with me. My youngest daughter is probably going to stay and finish Hunter College, and she, she's toying with coming because she could finish her last credits at UNLV. You went to Hunter? There you go. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, and then my son, he's definitely staying here because he's a police medic and he uh, has a career with that um, and is uh, enjoying that. So anyway, that is the more inside information. Yeah. Why don't you plant the church down there? You know, uh, Brother Wayne here, for those of you watching online, said, why don't I plant a church? And um, I have wrestled with that. I've never viewed my gifting as planting, and somebody actually came up to Henry and said, hey, why don't you start a campus in the Las Vegas area? And, you know, have Pastor Steve, you know, be the campus pastor there. Uh, you know, churches have done things like that. The Journey in New York City has a campus in Florida. You know, they, they made the decision, and it kind of makes sense because so many people from New York go to Florida. Um, you could uh, you can do that. but. Um, I've been hesitant with that theme because it means raising lots of money and um, it's a great place to plant a church because it's one of the fast and growest air, fastest growing areas in the United States. Um, the development that I'm in has 3,000 homes built and they're totaling out at 13,000 homes built. That's how many building and they're just building constantly. And the, the rule of thumb with church planting is if you move into a fast-growing area, if you at least have a pulse, you can grow a church. Um, so that is certainly a possibility, but all the elements of fundraising and all that kind of stuff, uh, I don't really get into that. Now, if the Lord opens a door that says, Steve, this way with big giant signs, you know, I'll obey where the Lord wants to, to lead. Last night at the congregational meeting, I did quote the scripture, man makes his plans, it's the Lord who determines the outcome. So if you find me here past Easter, that means the Lord determined the outcome. <laughs> and Henry said something very gracious to me. He said, Steve, I know you've told me no later than Easter, but you can stay as long as you want. And uh, that was nice, and I appreciated that. I think Pastor Henry's concerned that, you know, Jack will leave the same time I'm leaving and he doesn't want to like this mass exodus of, uh, you know, key individuals at the church. But he also extended the invitation to me to come and preach whenever I'm in town. And so that might be nice. Um, the only thing is because we now have secret preaching, we don't know where, you know, the word will have to get on the street that, oh, Pastor Steve is going to be in wherever <laughs> that particular week. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I am, uh, I am truly looking forward to what God has in store. I have said for many, many years that the Lord has a wonderful way of letting you know when it's time to retire. You die. And until then, you keep busy. And so, to me, that is what I need to be doing, and I would encourage everyone here to be doing. You may change what you're doing, but you should still be busy in what God has for you. All right, so there's the, the lowdown, and I'm sure you'll hear more as we uh, move along. Um, by the way, it's one of the reasons why we are trying to do Jeremiah at a pretty good clip, because as it stands, we'll finish Jeremiah at the end of March. 
um, and that would be the timing for potentially you know me moving to Nevada and so that was intentional um, to try to do that to take on a, a big challenge of a, a big book in the Bible the longest book in the Bible um, that catches us off guard but there are more words than the book of Psalms less chapters more words and uh, so it is a significant book let's pray Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have tonight to worship you through the study of your word. And Father, I thank you for very personal reasons that our lives are in your hands. Uh, Father, we look at the, the world around us, the turbulence, things that are just not sure, an election coming up, and you know, what is that going to change? Is it going to change anything? There are many things in this world that do bring us anxiety. But I keep coming back to the words your son Jesus said in the book of John. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so, Father, we move to the future with anticipation that good things are ahead. It doesn't mean we'll understand it all. And some things kind of catch us off guard. But, Father, we know because you do see the end from the beginning, we have hope. Because we've come to see that you are good. And we pray, Father, that we would see your goodness in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so moving to our quiz, our brother Ken had said his, his objective is to have a, a 10 out of 10 at some point on uh, one of these quizzes. And I take it he hasn't been there just yet. But uh, uh, Barbara and Wayne know what that feeling feels like. Our sister Mary knows what that feeling feels like. Um, there are a few others. Karen, I think, has gotten a tenor a couple times. That's great. But we can all aspire to that. But let's face it. I sometimes word these questions in kind of a trickery and cruel way that, you know, can be just pure mean, you know. But let's see how we do, okay? So quiz number seven. Uh, first question is this. Oh, by the way, for those of you watching online, if you want to look at the quiz, you go to Shelter Rock Church, you click on events. Then when you get to the events page, you click on groups, you type in the word Jeremiah, and then become a member of that group if you haven't, and you'll see all the resources available. So here we go. Jeremiah descends from, Jeremiah descends from prophets, priests, kings, slaves now the tempting well the, the first one I hope if you listen to class is priests but it's also slaves why all the Jews descend from slaves in Egypt so that was like hey, wait a second that's tonight's curveball for you is it true do you know of a Jew that did not descend from slavery in Egypt? I do not. <laughs> so there you go. But I mean, consider generous grading. B is the right answer. If you picked A or C, um, Pastor Leslie is listening to me teach through the book of John, which I did years ago, as she jogs. It's, it's on the church app. You can listen to all the Bible classes from the past. Anyway, she's listening to the book of John. And you know how I say, if you like picked A or C, hang your head in shame? Apparently in the book of John, I said, no cookie for you. <laughs> so um, yeah, that, I mean, those are not a embarrassing picks. But B and D are the right answer. And B, mostly the right answer, because that's what we taught in class. D, you just have to be so sharp and brilliant, men and women, to know that. All right, here's the next one, number two. If chapters 7 to 10 talk about the temple, you might remember this, they said, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Babylon's not going to do anything to us because we have the temple. Chapters 11 to 17 speak of A, Babylon, C, the covenant, D, uh, C, fear, and D, the exile. And the answer is the covenant, the covenant. Good, did that one okay, Ken? I'm glad to hear it. Eases my mind. All right, number three. Jeremiah uses imagery from the book of 
excuse me, from what book of Torah? Now, just to give you a little update, if you're not familiar, Torah is just the word coming from Hebrew, meaning law. And there are five books in the Old Testament designated the books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so which of those five books is uh, Jeremiah using imagery from? And the answer is, I've only mentioned four of the five here, but it is Deuteronomy. We think that this is the book that Josiah found um, when he was king. And it's basically a summary of the law. And deutero means second. So it's second law. Or it's the retelling of the law that was given in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Okay, number four. A land of milk and honey conveys a, st a sticky and smelly goat's milk and sweet wine or bees honey a place of plenty, an order at Starbucks. <laughs> and uh, yeah, D is true, but not really something from the class. Not from the class. But it is goat's milk and sweet wine or bees honey is what I specifically said in class. But it takes on metaphorical significance as a place of plenty. And so it does have a literal meaning, and they would take it literally because they were always a people that had pastures. If you remember when they were in Egypt, they even took care of animals, and the Egyptians found that to be an abomination. Um, you remember when Joseph came there with his family? They didn't want them mingling because they didn't value the trade of shepherds. It was considered a, a lower trade. But um, so to see a place where there'll be goats and goat's milk and, you know, grazing, they thought that was a wonderful thing. And the idea of sweet wine or bees honey, it's just like, who doesn't want some sweets now and then? And that just speaks of like a luxury or a richness. So it's B and C. Number five, God calls this evil, disobedient people, traitors, Whores, the one I love, my beloved. And the answer is, there's three of them there. Now, when I say whores, that depends on your translation. Prostitutes is what the NIV says. Whores is another word for it that other translations have. But I literally pulled out, that's why it's in quotes, the one I love and my beloved. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this contrast is because God uses all these loving, endearing terms. But when he uses the nasty terms, he's referring to their actions. And their actions are repugnant to him. And so that is why that comes up. He does not call them traitors. You could argue that he does. And if you put that, you could make an argument in that they're not honoring what God wants. But um, that word does not get used overtly. Number six, the community that wants to put Jeremiah to death is, so it's an actual town, Shiloh, Jerusalem, Anathoth, a Levitical town. And it is Anathoth, which is a Levitical town, founded in the book of Joshua. Did you get that, Ken? Well, Anathoth is right. You make this impossible. But <laughs> for those of you watching online, our brother says, I make this impossible. I think we just need to raise our bar of learning there, Ken. Just, you know, keep the goals high. Now, did anyone put D also? There you go. See, it's apparently not impossible that Wayne got it. <laughs> we, have, we have some people who can do it. So keep pressing on, Ken. Don't, don't give up. Don't give up. Of course, now that I'm speaking on the Internet, hundreds of people now know that Ken's struggling with the quiz here. But we'll, we'll keep pressing on. So if you see Brother Ken on Sunday morning, you know, shake his hand and say, I'm praying for your brother. Okay, here we go. 
Number seven, the Lord calls Israel slash Judah a thriving brothel, nation, olive tree, disease. I'll give you a hint. There's only one right answer. (laughs) An olive tree. And Paul picks up on this theme in Romans, I believe it's chapter 11, when he says that we, the Gentiles, are grafted in to the olive tree. And the olive tree, as a symbol of Israel, comes from the book of Jeremiah. And so Paul is making reference to that verse indirectly. So it is an olive tree. Number eight, the speckled bird of prey reminds Pastor Steve of, now for this you had to have been in class, you just had to have been in class, Um, his dad, eagles, the church of God, the Holy Spirit. And the answer is his dad and the church of God. Now why is this? Is because in 1939, 1940, my dad recorded an actual record album um, privately. He didn't get a record contract or anything, but he played his guitar and he sang a song which was written in 1934, The Great Speckled Bird of the Bible. And it was a song, it was funny because my, my dad was raised in Jamaica, Queens, but he ha- we had family in Tennessee and he f- recorded it in Tennessee. And so he put on this fake Southern accent when he sang the song, which was just kind of cute and funny. The, the record eventually disintegrated about 25 years ago. All the vinyl just fell off this metal plate, which was annoying because it would have been nice. I wish I recorded it on some other format. But, you know, to hear your dad singing when he's 16 years old it was just kind of fun, you know, uh, seeing him do that. But anyway, the song refers to, is the the verse refers to Israel being the speckled bird. And the song says that the speckled bird is the church of God. So the song adds that extra phrase. So if you didn't get that one, you weren't in class, like you just didn't, you know, you missed that one. What can I say? Number nine, who are the shepherds? who ruin my vineyard, A, prophets, B, priests, C, kings, D, Babylonians. It's everyone except the Babylonians. In fact, those three are mentioned regularly, prophets, priests, kings. They are the ones who are causing uh, problems. And if you remember in in the New Testament, it specifically says that teachers are held to a higher level of responsibility. And that being true, you see this is, you might say that author, I think it's Hebrews that says that, but it's pulling it, uh, James, James says that. Uh, it's pulling it from this. If you are a person who is considered a prophet, if you're a person who is considered a priest, a king, you have responsibilities and you should be held to a higher uh, responsibility. Um, That is um, helpful. Number 10, what do the people of Israel need to circumcise? A, their friendships, B, their hearts, C, their temple, D, their ears. Now, if you're thinking literal circumcision, you're thinking there shouldn't there be one other category? Uh, That's not the one that Jeremiah talks about. What he does talk about is circumcising your heart and circumcising, surprisingly, your ears. An uncircumcised ear doesn't hear. Circumcised ear hears. What's funny about this, this actually uh, comes from verse 10 of chapter 6. It says, their ears are closed. But if you read the footnote, it says their ears are uncircumcised. And so what the NIV has done is it translated the idiom. 
so it's more un, you know more understandable as to what's going on but I, I kind of like ears being uncircumcised because it kind of pops you kind of like have to figure what does he mean by that and then you can you can figure it out it means you're not listening um, one of the early verses that I memorized picked up in this theme which was Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 Behold, the hand of the Lord is not too short that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but it is your iniquities that become between you and your God that he cannot hear. Um, so Isaiah picks up that same kind of theme. All right, with that in mind, anyone do, let's see, seven or better? Wonderful. Excellent. So, um, congratulations. I would like to say that I got one line on every single question. There you go. <laughs> there were seven answers, seven questions with multiple answers. I know, isn't that awful? You know, they say trauma, you know, of, let's, say, let's say your parents did something wrong or they had some habit, and you as the kid, I'll never do that, and lo and behold, you're doing the same thing. You know, and... Uh, I was out in Nevada last week for a few days for this job interview, and my daughter and I went out to dinner. Well, her husband was out working, so I get like personal conversation with my daughter. And as she's mentioning some things, so she's first year marriage, and she's mentioning, he doesn't like this about me, he doesn't like that about me, he doesn't like this about me. And I said to my daughter, I said, you realize that you married a guy who's a lot like your dad? I mean, because, like, for example, my daughter enjoys a glass of alcohol. I never drink, ever. I mean, don't taste it. Um, the first time I had alcohol, I went to a, a Lutheran church because I was dating a young woman who was Lutheran, and I almost spit out the port wine. I, I had no idea. I thought it was going to be grape juice. It, it wasn't, you know, and I just don't drink. And so he, she mentioned another thing. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's daddy too. Like Michelle is very loosey goosey on cleaning the house, let's say, or something like that. My daughter is very loosey goosey, but if we're having company over, I'm out with the vacuum, making sure the place is okay. Michelle is like, she'll get to it. You know, it, it's just not her wiring. And once again, I said to my daughter, I hate to tell you, you married a guy like that. You know, he's, he does these very similar things. So pretty much everything she mentioned was one of my hangups. The only difference is because I'm older, I just don't care so much anymore. There was a time, oh, this is the, th the third one. When Michelle and I got married, we were going to church. I'd be in the car honking the horn, will you come out here? And, and you know, that is not a way to endear your wife to you. Let me tell you this. So, so let's say I'd get tired and I'd go inside and she, she would turn to me and say, if you want to stand here, you're not going to speed me up in any way, shape or form. And um, I mean, Michelle's a very stubborn woman that way. And um, you know how we solved this? We took two cars to church. And you know what? I have told this in premarital counseling. You don't need to resolve every issue. You don't. You can do workarounds. And you know, that's one of the reasons I'm in ministry is because we started taking different cars. So I went early and I started volunteering and teaching and all this kind of stuff. And so, I, so her husband is like, Melody, it's time to go to church. You know, and, and Melody's like, I'm coming, relax, you know. But meanwhile, they're a few minutes late or, you know, something. So I just found it so funny. She married daddy. <laughs> and, and it actually, and, and uh, Michelle and Melody have a lot of similarities. What can I say? <laughs> All right, that's more information than you needed to hear, of course. Um, so let's go to chapter 13. Um, and it's entitled The Linen Belt, A Linen Belt. So here we go. This is what the Lord said to me. Go and buy a linen belt and put it around your waist, but do not let it touch the water. So I bought a belt as the Lord directed and put it around my waist. 
Now, this is the first time Jeremiah is going to be acting out a prophetic word. He's going to do it again uh, several times. But in this time, he's, he's acting out. And the Lord has done this with his prophets. Jeremiah was told to walk naked for a while, you know, to make a point. Um, so this is an example. Now, a word about this belt. We don't know exactly what he's referring to. The NIV and many translations say, uh, excuse me, I said leather, linen belt. But we think it may be, um, it could be linen underwear. It could also be something like, a, uh, that would be a loincloth. But it can also be kind of something you wrap around your waist that has pockets in it. So you can store something in it. Um, we're not sure because the word doesn't show up much in the Bible. It's, it's a very, um, uh, not a word that's used a lot, so we don't have an example. But this we do have a connotation of. It's a costly item. So just picture you go to the Magnificent uh, uh, Mile, um, Miracle Mile, uh, Manhasset, and you go to Gucci, and you get yourself a nice item to wear. And God says to them, treat it nice, treat it nice. You know, don't let water get on it. Don't let this thing be ruined. Uh, by the way, the fact that it's linen do cause scholars to wonder if it's the linen underwear because that is what the priests would wear. And Jeremiah comes from a priestly background. However, other scholars, and I would tend to lean on them, think it's an outer garment that probably has pockets. And the reason why they lean that way is because this is a demonstrated sign. And if it's underwear, who's seeing it? But if it's outerwear, it forms more of a prophetic symbol. So I bought the, a belt as the Lord directed and put it around my waist. Then the word of the Lord came to me a second time Take the belt you bought and are wearing around your waist and go now to Pereth and hide it there in a crevice in the rocks. So I went and hid it at Pereth as the Lord told me. Now, this is a very interesting paragraph in ways that you don't know. The word the NIV is giving us here for Pereth is actually a specific word for the Euphrates, Euphrates River. Now, what big city is located on the Euphrates River that we've been talking about a lot? Babylon. And so the fact that it mentions the Euphrates is interesting. However, the Euphrates River is 350 miles away. If we're going as far as Babylon, it's 500 miles away. So is the Lord telling Jeremiah, go take this belt that you're wearing around your waist, travel 350 miles and bury it, and then come back and get it another time? This would be, in the ancient world, a massive trip. So on this map, you could see Jerusalem, look at the Dead Sea, and then you look a little above the Dead Sea, a little bit to your left, and you see Jerusalem. But you also see right above Jerusalem, Anathoth. And that is his hometown. Just outside Anathoth is another place which is the same spelling as Pirath, but with a different vowel, a different vowel in the Hebrew. So here's what most scholars think, that he was not going to the Euphrates, which would be this ridiculously long trip, but he's going to this place, which is only a few miles away, but because the two words have one letter difference, it's a pun. In other words, the pun is, sounds like Euphrates, but it's actually over here. 
and what he is doing so here's a picture you know where the euphrates is you see that red line which is heading towards babylon the euphrates is just above that red line so that shows you the distance from jerusalem and by the way the reason why the red line goes in that direction it's because you don't go across the desert there's just nothing there and so you go north because you go along waterways you have uh, springs so that's the highway that you would travel and then you cut over and again parallel the euphrates river so you have a means of of uh, watering yourself so what's happening though is when he goes to a little bit north of anathoth it looks a little like this now this is just a picture of a wadi in the west of the united states we call it a wash what is that it's a dry riverbed so most of the time no water flows in a wadi it's just an empty area however in the desert like in nevada they have these like big bridges with nothing under them and you're like why did they build this giant bridge in the middle of the desert because when there's a downpour suddenly there's a river under that bridge and there's signs all over las vegas middle of the desert be careful for floods because it may happen three times a year but if you are on the bottom of like a wash like this like right now there's hardly any water flowing in this but if you are on the bottom when a torrential rainstorm comes picture all the rain coming off the mountains simultaneously and because the mountains are stone and rock they're not being absorbed into any soil they're just pouring in and suddenly you go from a few inches deep to six feet deep and storming water just flowing through in a very powerful way so that is where he's telling him to go parenthetical humorous little story so i'm in israel for the first time in 1996 and when you go to these obscure locations in israel there's no public restrooms i mean so you, the people are saying you know we had 45 of us in our group where are we going to go so what we would do is the ladies would take the wadi to the right and the men would take the wadi to the left and that's what you do and you find some bush somewhere and you do what you need to do but if you gotta go you gotta go you know it just came down to that one could raise the question why didn't they have a bus with a bathroom in it very good question but apparently the seminary i was with was cheap and so they didn't have a bus with a bathroom and so we ended up calling them wadi stops um and uh, you know people would actually can we take a wadi stop you know and it would be one of these dry river beds that we would uh, avail ourselves so anyway this is where he goes and he hides it in a crevice and i like this picture because you can imagine lots of crevices that are present um, that he's supposed to hide this belt jeremiah is probably thinking lord what in the world are you telling me this for it's bizarre but jeremiah is obedient if anything verse 6 many days later the lord said to me go now to parath and get the belt i told you to hide there so we went to parath dug up the belt took it from the place where i had hidden it but now it was ruined and completely useless so that was the point so again here you got your gucci bag and god said oh you, god told me to buy it great awesome you know god wants me to live in style and then he says okay bury it in a place prone to floods I'm like okay lord okay i'll do what you want me to do god does this sometimes you remember what naaman was instructed dip yourself seven times in the jordan river and if you've been to israel you know what the muddy jordan looks like not an impressive river we're not talking the Caribbean where it's like this crystal blue water you can see deep. It's like the Hudson, you know, I mean, it's, it's not an attractive, and I don't mean the size of the Hudson, it's a tiny river, but it is muddy. Um, and God sometimes asks us to do things that do not make sense. 
note to self. Sometimes the Lord may ask you to do something which doesn't make sense. And then you just kind of like see what God has in store. But uh, this is not only for Jeremiah to have that issue. We have that issue with the Lord sometimes. But now the Lord is going to give us the teaching of this. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord says. In the same way as this belt was ruined, I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. Just as that belt became, in the previous paragraph, completely useless. So now in this paragraph, what is becoming useless? The pride of Judah and the pride of Jerusalem. And we read, These wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, and go after other gods and worship, serve and worship them, so uh, will be like this belt completely useless. For as a belt is bound around the waist, so I bound all the people of Israel and all the people of Judah to me, declares the Lord, to be my people for my renown and praise and honor, but they have not listened. Now, this is a very beautiful passage, although painful. The first thing I want you to see in verse 11 is it was bound around the waist so that all the people of Israel and Judah, uh, to me, th this is what God is saying, I wanted you close to me. That's the whole idea. And by the way, some scholars who argue that this is the linen underwear because of the priest, they were saying because of the intimacy of God wanting it nearby. But there's another side that, that scholars lean the other way, that it's an outer garment, because this people were to be my people for renown, praise, and honor, but they have not listened. In other words, when he, they were, when Jeremiah was wearing this beautiful belt, what he wanted the people to see is that's the way I think of you. I'm proud of you. It's like the parent who wants to constantly show pictures of their grandkids. You know, it's like, uh oh, don't get him talking about his grandkids. Don't get him started, you know, because the moment that comes up, they're like, oh, let me show you the pictures here. The wallet comes out, the pictures, of course, now it's the phone that comes up. And, you know, you show the pictures of what's precious to you. That is what God is calling his people. They're precious to me. I want to display you. Now, this is similar to the language in Jeremiah 33. Now listen to this, because this is what leads us to say that it is an outside garment. I will cleanse them from all their sin that they have committed against me and forgive all their sin and rebellion against me. Then this city will bring me renown, joy, praise, and honor before all the nations of the earth that hear of all the good things that I do for it. And they will be in awe and will tremble at the abundant prosperity and peace I will provide for it. <coughs> Excuse me. So looking at this Jeremiah passage, which comes much later in the book, and that's a prophecy of what's going to happen later. But the fact that God is saying, I want my people to be someone I brag on. You know, kind of like, you remember the beginning of the book of Job? Satan comes from touring around the world. And uh, what did God say to Satan? Have you checked out my servant Job? Isn't he amazing? I mean, God is like that father who wants to show pictures of his kids. He wants to brag on Israel. But he gives that whole demonstration of that beautiful belt from Gucci becoming a rag to say, this is what I'm wearing now. This is what it's like. He wants the people, he wants Jeremiah to capture this visual stimulation. You know, I had a, a nice compliment a couple weeks ago by a woman who goes to her camp. Usually she goes to Syosset. 
but she's one of those people who follows me wherever Pastor Steve is preaching. Nice for my ego. I will, I will admit it is nice to see that. So she wrote me and said, could you please let me know where you're going to be? But she has a cute reason for it. She has two little kids and she wants her kids to be in the service. And she said, Pastor Steve, you always use these props. You always use these models and examples that kids relate to. And my kids seem to like that. And I want them to love church. Well, after my ego got exploded a little bit, you know, I will admit it's nice to hear. But my point is that does come from scripture. If it's good enough for the Lord to do it, I feel it's good enough for any preacher to do it. And so if there is something we can show, like a couple weeks ago, Pastor Jim preached on John 15. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, the same brings forth much fruit. And he pointed out this house, I guess it's your neighbor, that had this vine. I mean, this little tiny garden, little tiny garden. And this vine, it's, it's like a snake. And it loops around and he found out they're winter melons. And, but it was very visual to see that this melon would not survive outside of this long vine. When you capture the image, it helps you see the power of what is going on. And to picture, you know, what is that phrase that people say, uh, 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 lipstick on a pig or something? a sow, I forget what it is, but it's, it's that same kind of image that Israel has become a shame on Yahweh because they're just so different. They're so apart. There, there's a cool movie, I really like it, um, called the, um, Roe Diefendorf always showed this movie, uh, The Something Gift, uh, the, ultimate. the Ultimate Gift. But in this movie, you have this very decent guy and kids that are like a disaster. But one of the lines in the movie is, it's amazing how far the apple can fall from the tree. And then the next person said, and still roll a great distance beyond that. And it's true. Sometimes you see that. And that's what we see here. Yahweh, the picture of mercy, love, justice, holiness, and his people anything but. Um, and so that is the whole point. Now, this chapter began with a picture of clothing. The chapter is going to end with another depicture, uh, uh, depiction of clothing, but in a sad way. So I just want to point out that's, that is intentional probably by Jeremiah. The chapter begins with this image of clothing that becomes defiled and it's going to end with a picture of clothing. But before we get that, we move to wineskins, wineskins. Verse 12, say to them, this is uh, what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Every wineskin should be filled with wine. Oh, it makes sense. If you got a wineskin, put wine in it. And if they say to you, don't we know that every wineskin should be filled with wine? In other words, begging the question, why should it be filled with wine? Then tell them, this is what the Lord says, I am going to fill with drunkenness all who live in the land, including the kings who sit in David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all those living in Jerusalem. I will smash them against one another, parents and children alike, declares the Lord. I will allow no pity or mercy or compassion to keep me from destroying them. So what we see is the wineskin is not talking literal wine. It's that the people are going to behave in such a way that they will not, they'll be, they'll be like drunken people that have no control over their actions. Out of curiosity, if you're brave, you don't have to answer this, but what percentage of you um, if you're brave, if you're brave, never drink at all. Okay, about, about almost half. Okay, so I'm in the club with you guys. Okay, but I'm wondering if any of you who are in that category of me 
have ever wondered what it's like to be drunk. I, I have been curious about that. I mean, it doesn't like burn in me, but I have been curious, particularly when I was younger, you know, because my friends would be like, it's the weekend party time, you know, and I'm like, and I'm like, when I saw them on Monday with red eyes, I'm like, I don't think party means what you think it means, you know, because, you know, the college crowd, they're known for, you know, overdoing it, you know, with drinking. But there, I will admit, I w I've been curious about it. My only problem is I just don't like the taste of alcohol. And every time I taste it, I'm like, why would I drink this a second time? You know, that port wine did me in. You know, I just don't, I don't want it. And, you know, someone else, they have a slice of pizza and they want a mug of beer, you know, that goes with that. I, 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 I see that craving in their eye. But I look at this and I say, okay, there's an element here I do not understand. But if you could picture drunkenness to where you're just, the inhibitions are not there, um, that is what he's describing. And that last verse is, is sad. It says, declares the Lord, I will allow no pity or compassion um, or mercy to keep them from destroying, to keep me from destroying them. Now, that raises, I think, fair questions for you and I. Why would God do that? I mean, he like wants them to finish this pathway. The next section kind of flows through and helps us understand a little bit more. Not perfectly, but it helps us a little bit. Look at verse 15. Hear and pay attention. Do not be arrogant, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings the darkness, before your feet stumble on the darkening hills. Your hope for light, but he will turn it to utter darkness and change it to deep gloom. Now, this darkness is the exact same word from Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Remember, Frank, we were talking about that just uh, last Sunday, I think it was. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which is the old King James in that. But this idea of this darkness is coming. It's coming. It can't be stopped. It will be coming. But do you remember a story in the book of Joshua? So they conquer Jericho, and then they go against this little town called Ai, and they lose. And, and Jer Joshua like rends his garments and says, Lord, you said we were going to conquer the promised land. We take on the city of Jericho, and we win. And you have us be defeated at Ai? And then the Lord says this, there's sin in the camp. Do you remember the name of the guy who was caught red-handed? Achan. Achan. So when it is revealed that Achan is the one who failed, this is what we read. This is Joshua chapter 7. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me, what you have done, do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, does anyone remember? Did everyone like have hugs after that? And it was all better, and we're good, and let's keep moving on? No, Achan was destroyed. The reason I'm pointing this out is in this passage, give glory to the Lord your God is very similar to Job when Job says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. What's the next phrase? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Very good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, there are some times in our life that bad stuff happens. But here is the ultimate principle. Are you going to have the arrogance? Because you notice this passage specifically said that. Pay attention. Do not be arrogant. Verse 15. Are you going to have the arrogance to say, What are you doing, Lord? Or are you going to be acknowledging that, what does Isaiah 55 say? 
My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth are as high as my thoughts and ways are above your thoughts and ways. Now, I have to admit, I don't like that. I don't like it at all. I like it when the Lord explains to me why my brother passed away in February of 2001. Steve, this is why. And, you know, explain it all to me. And I have it fully understanding. And, and I go, Lord, it's painful, but I get it. I never had that conversation with the Lord. He never stopped and said, Steve, let me explain it to you fully. I've gotten pieces of it. And, I, and I've seen it, but the day will come in glory when I'll, I'll see, even as I'll know, even as I am fully known, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. But I'm not there yet. In this case, there is one responsibility of the believer. Lord, I give glory to you. Do you remember Eli the priest? When he goes to Samuel, what did, what did the voice of the Lord say to you? Tell me, don't hide anything. And Samuel said, judgment is coming to your family, Eli. And then Eli responds, the Lord has spoken. May it be done as you have said. You know, I mean, it's like shocking to hear it, but Eli actually responded maturely. Because here's a, that's at the play when you say something like that. You are just acknowledging that the one who created the heavens and the earth knows a little bit more than you. Do you remember at the end of Job? After Elihu has his talk with Job, then the Lord speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And the Lord, you know, sits Job down and says, hey, Job, let me explain why this happened. Satan came in and, uh, you know, he wanted to know if we would, uh, so we had a bet. We had a bet to see if you would uh, do it. I, I won the bet, by the way. You did great. Uh, but now I'm going to give you a whole bunch of stuff. Did the Lord do that? For those of you who know the book of Job, he doesn't do anything like that at all. What he does is starts giving Job a series of questions which are very, very profound. Were you there when I created the earth? Were you there when I spoke and stars came into existence? Were you there? And he goes down this whole long list of questions. And does Job have any positive answers to it? No, he says, I have spoken, I shall speak no more. He, he realizes, how can you say to the living God, I don't get what you're doing. Well, you can say it, <laughs> but at the end of the day, God is saying, give glory to me. Even though the darkness is coming, it is coming. Give glory to me. Now, that's a tough thing to swallow. And, and by the way, when you're going through scripture like this, don't pretend that we have it all figured out. We don't. As a teacher, I do not have it all figured out. There are sometimes I walk away from a passage and I scratch my head just like you would scratch your head. I can give you a, a commentary answer. I can give you a reasoned answer. But there are sometimes at the end of the day, I don't know. But I do know this. The Bible has told me enough that in all circumstances, I give glory to God. Because he sends the rain. He brings the sun. And I still say, blessed be the name of the Lord. So I, I go on. Verse 17. If you do not listen, you will weep in secret because of your pride. So here's the third use of the word pride. Hmm. Note to self. Does God value pride? I mean, is that something we should really nurture in our lives? Funny thing about pride is that when you're being proud you should be ashamed. And why do you think God doesn't like pride? Because it doesn't reflect a person who's dependent upon him. It's kind of like we think we did this. And I am so susceptible to pride. Because I wrote a dissertation on humility, people say, oh, Pastor Steve, you're just such a humble person. It's like, I wrote a dissertation on humility because I needed to learn how to be humble. It's not that it comes natural. It does not come natural to me. In fact, the other day, for those of you who are friends on Facebook, I posted this picture of me preaching at the Westbury Theater, um, what used to be called the Westbury Music Fair. I love this picture because there's me on the stage and you see this, you know, 
2,500 people all around me, and I'm preaching. But I look at this, and I, that's me. <laughs> I can't help it. I mean, why did I even post it? Because I like the picture, you know? And I, I probably said something in the caption, good memories of the past, or, you know, something that sounded more innocuous. But the flesh part of it was, I have still preached to more people than you did, Pastor Henry. <laughs> because I'm fleshly. <laughs> and, you know, because we never had a big Easter since, you know, COVID. Uh, by the way, parenthetical thought, if you were at the L, uh, congregational meeting, uh, Henry did budget for us to go to have a service at Tillis. We're not sure if it's going to be Easter, though. But it's going to be because the church turns 80 this year. Church was founded in 1943. And so he wants to have a big celebration celebrating um, that. And so it's possible we're going to be for Easter or it'll be possible for another time. But we are going to have a, a CW Post, Long Island University um, event at Tennis Center in all likelihood. So that's kind of fun. It'll be cool. So we move on. My eyes will bitterly weep, overflowing tears, because the Lord's flock is taken captive. Now, this poem that I'm reading right now is authored by Jeremiah. In other words, we're getting his feelings here. And so here is the weeping prophet. My eyes are overflowing with tears. And by the way, this has not happened yet. He just knows it's going to happen, and it breaks his heart because the Lord's flock will be taken captive verse 18 say to the king and to the queen mother now we think this could be Jehoiachin but it could be Jehoiakim and it could be Zedekiah we don't know it's one of those kings most scholars lead to Jehoiachin um, but it says, so tell the king and the queen mother, come down from your thrones for your glorious crowns will fall from your heads. The cities of the Negev will be shut up and there will be no one to open them. Now, I'm going to go back to this map page here. Um, and to understand the poetry here, you see what's listed here as uh, Moab, and on, on, this is in the south part, and uh, Idumea. That is the southern part of the map. The Negev is below. Where is this force coming from? The north. Remember, tell it in Dan which is the city all the way up north. It's actually more north than this uh, map even shows. But the reason why this, what this is saying about the Negev will be shut up, if anyone in Judea read that line, they know that the army has already plowed through Judea and Jerusalem. So the Negev is saying it's over for us. So it's actually pointing to um, what happens because that is south. And all of Judah will be carried into exile, carried completely away. So verse 20, look up and see who are coming from the north. Where is the flock that was entrusted to you? The sheep which you boasted what will you say when the Lord sets over you those you cultivated as special allies? Now, what that's saying is when Judah was trying to deal with Assyria or the Egyptians, they had made a deal with Babylon trying to get help against Egypt. And he's saying the ones you made a deal with, those special allies... They're the ones the Lord's going to conquer. They're going to conquer you. Will not pain grip you like a woman in labor? 
And if you ask yourself, why has this happened to me? It is because of your many sins that your skirts have been torn off and your body mistreated. There's your second reference for clothing. It started with a clothing that was something to be proud of, the beautiful belt, and now it is your skirts are being torn off, which conveys absolute shame. Now, verse 22, and if you ask yourself, why has this happened to me, is a very important time to remember now who is reading this book. How does Jeremiah begin? It begins with this knowledge. Here we are. I'm going to read chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, and then I'll skip to the end of the paragraph, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. So the primary, if you wanted to say, what is the thesis statement of the book of Jeremiah? It's why did this happen to us? How did we end up here? So the people reading this book are post temple destruction. We're getting a record of all the sermons that were given, and some of them are given as live messages, but the book was written so that the people of another generation would know why this stuff happened. And the answer is given. It was because of the sin. Now, verse 23. Can an Ethiopian change his sin? Technically the Hebrew, a Cushite or Nubian. Or a leopard change its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Now, when you see Ethiopian, it's probably what you think. So this is from uh, Nubia or Ethiopia as we would know it today. We're talking a black skinned people. And he's saying, can somebody with black skin suddenly become white skinned? And then he says, can a leopard change his spots? So as much as those things are impossible, so you cannot do good and you are accustomed to doing evil. Verse 24, I will scatter you like chaff driven by the desert wind. This is your lot, the portion I have decreed for you, declares the Lord, because you've forgotten me and trusted false gods. I will pull up your skirts over your face. This is that shame again. And your shame may be seen. Your adulteries and lustful neighings, your shameless prostitution. I have seen your detestable acts on the hills and the fields. Woe to you, Jerusalem. How long will you be unclean? We're not talking necessarily literal prostitution. We are talking the worship of other gods, which sometimes does involve temple prostitutes, but that's not the primary force of the metaphor. The primary force is just not worshiping the Lord. So as a result, Something's going to happen. Drought, famine, sword. Chapter 14. This is what the Lord that came to Jeremiah, excuse me, this is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Judah mourns, her cities languish. Now, before I um, go any further with that, I want to point out this is what the Lord said in the Torah in Deuteronomy that was going to happen if they didn't obey the law. So this is, you know, way before. The sky over your head will become bronze, which is a poetic way of saying you can't get rain out of it. The ground beneath you, iron, which means you can't grow anything out of it. The Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder. It will come down from the skies until they are you are destroyed. So that is the image what's happening. And so now they're dealing with famine. They wail for the land. A cry goes up from Jerusalem. Verse 3, the nobles send their servants for water. They go to the cisterns, but find no water. They return. And by the way, the idea of nobles, drought affects everyone because even the wealthiest are going to deal with the lack of water. That's when it says the nobles will send servants for water and they will find them. 
They will return with their jars unfilled, dismayed, despairing. They cover their heads. The ground is cracked because there is no rain in the land. The farmers are dismayed. They cover their heads. Even the doe in the field uh, deserts her newborn fawn because there is no grass. Wild donkeys stand on the barren heights and plant and pant like jackals. Their eyes fail for lack of food. Let's just pretend for a moment you're Jeremiah and you have just said these words to the people. How are you feeling about your Sunday morning message? It's tough. Because on one hand, Jeremiah, I don't even think he feels, I mean, he, he's preaching with conviction. In fact, the Lord says, I will make your words a blast furnace. We talked about that previously. But there are some things that we say, you know, if we're honoring the word of the Lord, that we in our heart, hard for me to say. And now Jeremiah is going to reflect on this. Again, why I have come to appreciate Jeremiah is he speaks what he's really thinking. And he causes us, who are often cowards before God and don't tell God what we really think, Jeremiah tells God what he thinks. We move on, verse 7. Although our sins testify against us, do something, Lord, for the sake of your name. That's a great prayer. Lord, act. For we have often rebelled and we have sinned against you. You, who are the hope of Israel, its Savior in times of distress, why are you like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who stays only a night? Why are you like a man taken by surprise, like a warrior powerless to save? You are among us, Lord, and we bear your name. Do not forsake us. This is what the Lord says about his people. And now comes a quote from the Lord. They greatly love to wander. They do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Again, Jeremiah is saying what he's really thinking here. And I think it is fair for you and I to ask these questions. You know, uh, I... I, Natalie, when I, when I see you, of course, I think of what your family went through. And, you know, when you lost your brother and Pastor Jim lost his son, what do you say when that happens? And in Pastor Jim's case, when you're the shepherd of the flock and you have deep, deep questions, what do you do? I mean, that happened with me. I'm a pastor of a church and I lost my brother. So, okay. I, and you know, it's really weird in Syosset. It happens to me very often. I am preaching away in Syosset and I look down in front of me, like right here, and that's where my brother's casket was. It's right in front of where I'm preaching. And it's just like I'm preaching about something could be on the hope of God. And I look down and I remember, yeah, my brother laid there. You know, and it... it, and it it smacks you in the face. And because I don't, I don't fully understand. And you know, the way you get past it is not having all the answers. It's coming to like Job saying, I was not there. I don't see the whole picture. And Lord, with what I cannot see, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to press on. I think John 6 really is the answer. Do you remember Jesus is with his disciples? And he's talking about, unless you eat my, drink my blood and eat my flesh, you cannot be my disciple. And the text says, lots of people started leaving. It's like, who is this guy? I'm not sure I want to follow him. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, will you leave me also? And it was Simon Peter, often known for putting his foot in his mouth, but not this time. He said, Lord, where would we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Uh, those of you who heard me teach many times, I give this quote a lot, but Bertrand Russell, England's most famous atheist back in the 1970s and 80s, when he was 85, he was on the BBC and he was asked, as England's most famous atheist, what do you have to look forward to? And he responded, 
I have nothing to look forward to except grim, unyielding despair. That's a worldview that I do not want to be a part of. I want to be a part of the worldview that says, like Peter, who else is talking about eternal life? I don't understand everything about this eating uh, your flesh and drinking blood. But at the end of the day, I like your worldview better than the rest of the worldviews out there. And that is where we come down to when we look at this. And so Jeremiah is just very honestly saying, Lord, I don't get you here. I do not get you. So we go on and it says this, then the Lord said to me, so the Lord enters the conversation. Do not pray for the well-being of this people. He actually says this three times in this in the Bible. Uh, excuse me, in Jeremiah. Chapter 7, chapter 11, chapter 14. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine, and plague. Je uh, Jeremiah enters the conversation again. But I said, Alas, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, you will not see sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you a lasting peace in this place. So here's Jeremiah's argument. Why do you quash these crazy preachers? They're telling the people, everything's going to be fine. Everything's good. And we have the same thing now. We have lots of churches around that like to tickle ears and inspire people. Everything's fine. Everything's good. And, and it's like hard to make sense of it. Who's telling the truth? Who's, who's lying? And that's what Jeremiah is saying. Lord, why don't you zip their lips? Get rid of them. And that's not one of the answers the, the Lord responds to. But we then hear, then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by the sword and, the, and famine. And the people they are prophesying will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because the famine and the sword. There will be no one to bury them, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. Wow. A few weeks ago when I was preaching, I think it was here, I talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So he's a German theologian teaching at Union Theological Seminary as a visiting professor in 1936. He sees what's going on in his home country of Germany. He has a cush job, great teaching position at Union Seminary. He doesn't have to go back, but he said, I need to go back. Ultimately, he died by execution one month before World War II was over in Germany. Now, we can look at his life and really raise questions. There's, there's, you know, we can say there's no answers here. He went back, by the way, because so much of the Lutheran Church had stopped uh, declaring truth and was giving, getting their sermons from the Nazi party. And he decided to work with churches that became what were called confessing churches, meaning those churches which would not yield to Nazi ideology. And as a result, confessing church pastors would actually be imprisoned, put in concentration camps, and put to death. Now, did Bonhoeffer know why God allowed in Adolf Hitler and Nazism and fascism to hold sway? He didn't. I don't. I mean, there really isn't great answers for that. I can give you, you know, some proposals but they're going to still be hard to accept. But what I noticed, this mature theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said, I need to go back. 
And that is the statement of faith that even though you don't understand why God is releasing this torrent of judgment, why this is going to happen. Now, the book of Daniel is going to give us some hints as to why, because it's going to turn out that, you know, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are actually going to turn the heart of Nebuchadnezzar himself. It's actually going to increase the glory of God in the long run. But does Jeremiah know this? He does not. All he knows is the suffering that is coming. Speak this word to them, the Lord says. Let my eyes overflow with tears, night and day without ceasing. For virgin daughter, my people, has suffered a grievous wound, a crushing blow. So the very God, you know, and your parents said to you, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you when they spank you, you know, or punish you. This is what God is saying here. Um, my eyes overflow with tears night and day without ceasing for virgin daughter. Now, if you remember, usually we hear virgin daughter Jerusalem. This is just a shorthand way of speaking of Israel or Jerusalem in such a touching, gentle way. If I go into the country, I see those slain by the sword. If I go into the city, I see the ravages of famine. Both prophet and priest have gone to the land they know not. Have you rejected Judah completely? Do you despise Zion? Now this is skipping back now to Jeremiah. Why have you afflicted us so that we cannot be healed? We hope for peace, but no good has come. A time for healing, but there's only terror. We acknowledge our wickedness, Lord, and the guilt of our ancestors. We have indeed sinned against you. For the sake of your name, do not despise us. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember your covenant. Remember we're saying this section is talking about covenant. The previous section was about the temple. Remember your covenant and do not break it. Do any of the worthless idols of the nations bring rain? Do the skies themselves send down showers? No, it is you, Lord, our God. Therefore, our hope is in you, for you are the one who does all this. Now, this statement of Jeremiah is to look in the face of disaster and still have hope. Remember the end of the book of Habakkuk? Though there are no animals in the stalls, there's no wheat in the fields, yet I will hope in the Lord who gives me the hope to, to go on to the high places with hinds feet. And that is a declaration that despite what I am seeing, I will have hope. It's a funny thing when you're going through trial. The happy perky verses are not always the ones that connect with you. You know, uh, you know, let's say I'm at my brother's funeral and somebody comes up to me. This didn't happen, but let's say somebody came up to me. Oh, Pastor Steve, remember, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. You know what? I, yeah, thank you. That's what I was, Karen just went boom. <laughs> you know, that is kind of what you feel like. You know what Job's comforters got right? When all this disaster happened for seven days, they just sat with him and just were quiet. You know, the Jewish community, they have this wonderful thing of sitting Shiva. It's just sitting with somebody. You don't have to say anything profound. You just sit with people and, and eat lots of food. They do have lots of food. But it's just sitting with people and grieving. What Jeremiah is doing is for a favor here is even saying in those seasons where God is doing something and you'd like him to do something else, I still have hope in you, Lord. And I, I go back to John 6. Where else would I go? Only you provide this hope that I need. Well, that concludes our evening. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the chance to go through difficult passages but Father, we also see in these passages a, a camaraderie with Jeremiah, understanding what he feels, what he's going through. Uh, Father, I thank you 
that you gave us these darker passages to help us through those dark seasons in our own life. But Father, I also take comfort that even as Peter said, where else are we going to find the words of eternal life? That in the midst of our darkness, we have come to trust you because we've seen that you love us so much. You gave us Jesus, who proved that death will be defeated and that eternal life is in your right hand. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming, and Lord willing, I'll see you next week.